Okay, today I'm just going to go through the final lecture of seaweed physiology and here we're looking at seaweed chemical defense and we're also looking at the invasion dynamics and the theoretical underpinnings that drive species invasions with a specific focus on invasive seaweed. So if you recall our stress concept, this time we're adding, in, adding in a new dimension of greater diversity and herbivores that can come under a combination of different stresses. Remember that stress is not just about the initial sense of that stress, that just one-off stress experience. It also can be multiple attacks from different herbivores. There can be more or fewer. They can have different effects at different times of the year with different levels of grazing, for example. Here we see a picture of Litorina obtusata on a frond of Fucus serratus. It shows that grazing just, just occurs on many different intertidal species of seaweed. So when seaweeds are grazed, they can take a two-step approach. One is that some seaweeds just simply tolerate the amount of grazing that's going on. They allow material to be lost because they can afford it. So you grow fast and you always replace that tissue that's lost through grazing. Now some species don't use that strategy. Some species resist grazing through the production and development of defense. So they may induce the defense or the defense may be there all of the time. And that depends on the kind of adaptation that a species has undertaken. Now just to take tolerance a little step further, is that tolerance can be a very risky strategy to undertake. This is because grazers won't remove the least valuable tissues. They will remove any tissue at random. So theoretically, they could graze away at the base of the stipe and remove the whole alga, weakening them, leading to stochastic loss through wave and energy. So it depends on kind of what happens and where the grazers are actually attacking you. So some macroagro species need to be quite careful with a tolerance strategy, especially those that are long-lived or have high-value tissues near the holdfast, for example, that are pivotable, pivotal to the survival of the entire species. Some species develop structural defenses, such as the formation of calcium carbonate within their cells, for example, Coralina officinalis or Halamida species, they utilize that calcium carbonate within their structures to deter grazing. Others, on the other hand, utilize chemical defenses. And here we're particularly looking at fluorotannins. Fluorotannins are secondary, secondary metabolites that are produced by several species of algae. There may be other defensive chemicals other than fluorotannins, depending on the algal species that we're looking at. Now, the diversity of secondary metabolites is huge. What they're used for can be a wide variety of different um, compounds, can be used for different things. Red algae have the most diversity of secondary metabolites, followed by brown, and then green are the most simplistic. Now, producing these metabolites is energetically expensive. So, you need to look at how seaweeds allocate their resources. So for example, they have distinct groups of energetic areas that they're looking to, to do stuff with. For example, growth, reproduction and defense can be three different areas where you can allocate your resources. Now, under a low grading environment, you do not want to be putting in huge amounts of energy into defense because it's going to put you at a competitive disadvantage compared to the algae around you. So you'll induce defences during the occasion when there's high grazing intensity. This comes under what we call the optimal defence theory. An optimal defence indicates that species will allocate their energetic reserves into tissues that are higher value and defence in particular will be concentrated in those tissues that are of higher value. So here we have an example from Pavia et al. 2002 and we're looking here at a particular study that focused on 
the Aga Asifil and Medersim. And we see here that the defensive allocation differs for different tissues throughout the alga. Annual shoots, which are these parts here, that are grown every year, usually in some abundance, have fairly low level of defense. Receptacles too, and as you can see from this just single example, there are lots of receptacles on there. Even though they have a high value for the alga, losing a few of these is not going to catastrophically have an effect on the survivorship of the next generation of active film. The stipe, on the other hand, which is this central axis running down the alga, is highly valuable. If you don't have that, you don't have shoots, you don't have receptacles. And that is defended to a higher level than the other tissues surrounding it. So, by allocating your defense into tissues with the highest value for yourself, you're therefore optimally adjusting your defensive allocation. Some species also undergo what's called induced defences. But we just take a slight step back for that. We've got different terminology that we use to describe different defences. For example, constitutive defence is defence that's there all the time. The background level of defence to combat against a level of grazing which is present throughout time. However, it's expensive to do, it's expensive to maintain, it may put you at a disadvantage. Some algae contain what's known as activated defences. And activated defences are created through the transformation of a metabolite into something that has an anti-herbivore deterrent or role. Now, the ones I want to focus on here is induced defence. And induced defence is produced in response to a cue. And in Atophyllum modertum, looking at this, pad, this uh, top paper from 2005, we see induced defense in high value shoots when exposed to grazing. And that there is a reaction of the alga to try and reduce the amount of grazing that goes towards the energy, towards the formation of chemical defenses. Now, high overall herbivory will select for constituted defense, permanent defense. Whilst a low or temporal, temporally variable, Herbivory will select more for an inducible defense response. Induced defenses are seen in response to a variety of algae and a variety of grazers. And these two plots here from Ms. John Malanen and Kanan 2008 paper shows that different species from different groups, they generally are deterred by the presence of induced defense. So negative on this axis here indicates that they prefer the control alga over an alga that has had defenses induced within it. And that tends to be across the main variety of these different species. Echinoids here, they seem to have a different response. However, there's only two studies being cited in this particular meta-analysis. We see induced defense mostly in the brown algae also in some green and some red, but their responses can be variable. But brown tend to induce the most chemical defences. So how are these defences actually induced? Researchers have found that in some situations, by mechanically abrading it or snipping, cutting the, the um, alga, you won't induce a defence. However, if you utilise a chemical compound, a Q, which may be present in the saliva of a grazer, you actually can induce um, a response. And that is basically what this plot shows here. It shows that phlorotannins are heavily induced through natural grazing, and then not too far off, we've got this artificial approach. But if you just abrade it or you don't abrade it, you just add some chemical cue, you only get a smaller response. So really, it's about inducing this needs to be a reliable response. If you are inducing defences in response to wave energy, for example, you're going to be having a lot of false positives. You're going to be wasting a lot of energy on something that's not going to have a big effect. So I would say what you need to look at for an alga is that they will need to induce defences and minimise that false positive rate in order to have a really good defence against grazing. Now, 
chemical defenses not only deter grazers by saying, hey, so please don't eat me, I'm unpalatable to you, but they can also have long-term effects on grazers. And there's been lots of studies looking at maternal effects of feeding behaviour and so on, and how these are transferred onto the next generation of the grazer. And here we find, in this study by Batoth et al. 2005, we see that there's reduced fecundity when grazers consume tissues with a higher level of defence, so that they're actually the algae is actually having a knock-on effect in this arms race between the grazers and the algae coming together and fighting to see who can win. That's actually having a long-term effect on the grazing community. So they're highly valuable, highly effective compounds that are used in the ecology of the algae. So that concludes defensive chemicals. Now if we just quickly move on to invasion dynamics, and we're going to look here at Sargassum muticum. Brown algae originates from Asia, predominantly around Japan. It's become an incredible nuisance within Europe and the US. And it was first observed outside of its native range in 1941, and it's rapidly expanded up the coast of the UK, establishing first on the Isle of Wight in 1973. It spread all the way up the west coast of the UK now up to Scotland at approximately 69 kilometres per year and it tends to be found in sheltered areas such as harbours and lagoons. And here's an example of Sargassum. Now when I'm looking at the different theories that are talking about the invasion dynamic really we're looking at how Sargassum might respond. So the main theoretical context it's essentially an interplay of three main hypotheses, or maybe four, and as we start to get into that, we'll start to look at that in a little bit more detail. These pictures here illustrate sargassum in response to native algae and grazers. So the first theory that we'll look at is called the enemy release hypothesis. What that suggests is that when an algae or any invasive plant or animal enters a new range that the grazers there really don't know what to do with it. They've never seen it before. They don't know whether to eat it. They don't know what to do. So they leave it alone. That basically removes pressure from the agar that allows the agar to proliferate rapidly. I.e. there's no top-down grazing pressure acting upon the agar. One good example has come from this Rick Strom paper in 2006 that shows Fucus evanescens, which is an invasive algae. In its native range of Iceland, it has high levels of consumption from grazers, for example, Littorana obtusata. However, in an uh, invaded range, such as Sweden, we see much, much lower levels of consumption. So it's not getting the same level of top-down pressure. That indicates that that alga in Sweden, doesn't really have any specialist enemies. Enemies that have grown alongside it over millennia, and they don't really know what it is. So they're not really adapted to consume it, or the algae is doing something different. That means that there's no actual pressure coming along it. So it's really about the naivety of the grazer. The grazer's not adapted to take into account this novel food source. That's the enemy release hypothesis. The next hypothesis, that happens is the evolution of increased competitive ability hypothesis. This is essentially an extension to the ERH that suggests that release from herbivory will basically promote genotypes of the invader that allocate lots of resources to characteristics that make them more competitive, such as rapid growth, high fecundity, for example, rather than them allocating energy into defense or chemical defenses, structural defenses or chemical defenses. Okay? Now, the Brickstrom paper actually found the opposite. They found that the invaded alga was actually more defended than in its invasive range than in its native range, indicating that it's actually doing something that has, in a way, increased its competitiveness, but it hasn't been through the allocation of defensive chemicals. Now that 
actually support a slightly alternative um, hypothesis to the EICA, which is known as the Novel Weapon Hypothesis. Basically, it suggests that some species have a weapon, a chemical weapon, that has never been seen before. And this study here by Engi et al. 2012 suggests that that is true for the red arbor species Bonnie Mazona hamifera. Here you can see in this study that this particular compound 1133 tetrabromo 2 heptanone was not, has never been seen before by these grazers in the native range of the grazer, the invaded range of the agar. And that by exposing those grazers to that anti-herbivore compound, they are massively deterred from grazing upon particular substrates containing that compound. However, the control, they're quite happy to consume it at will. So they're having a novel chemical defense seems to release Bonnie Mazona hermifera from pressure from grazers. And that novel weapon there is essentially an extension of the EICA. Now, coming through after you've initially colonized, you've settled, you've proliferated, what happens? Well, eventually, the theory suggests that an invaded species will suddenly start to feel the effect of pressure from grazers around it. And this is through what we would describe as optimal foraging theory or competitive exclusion as well. Whereas we've got this new food source, it's highly abundant, it's there, but nothing's eating it. What happens? It's that a fraction of the population of a grazer may be displaced by competition, i.e. it can't consume its preferred food source because there's too much competition in the area, that they're pushed on to grazing this new abundant food source and then they start to like it and start to consume it eventually. They'll just wipe out that species, but that probably will never happen. This is part of what we call optimal foraging theory, is that it, when you're a grazer what you want to do is maximize the amount of energy you have per unit time spent grazing. So you want to feed on the very best, the very richest food sources. And that is the essential tenet of the optimal foraging theory. That suggests that over time, species will try and reduce the level of competition to maximize their food intake by going for new food sources. So that essentially are the invasive dynamics and chemical defenses of marine algae, with particular focus on brown species such as Sargassum muticum.